Welcome everyone for today's session. Uh, we're bringing to you another masterclass in our series of agriculture and environment um, masterclasses here from the University of Western Australia. So we're based in Perth, Australia. My name is Kirsty Brooks and it's been my pleasure to host this series uh, where we've heard from several of our UWA experts on how they're tackling global, regional and local issues in our natural environment. I'd just like to welcome our uh, presenter for today, Associate Professor Nick Callow, and he's going to talk to us today about how we can and are using remote sensing to tackle global problems. Nick is both a lecturer and a researcher here um, at the University of Western Australia in physical geography, and he'll go get into a bit more of the details about what, our, uh, what he does and who he works with throughout his talk. So, I'm not going to keep you any longer. We'll hand over to Nick and get started with the presentation. Super. Thanks a lot, Kirsty. Uh, I hope everyone's hearing me loud and clear. And, uh, you know, welcome to you all. It's very exciting to be able to, uh, to, uh, to talk with you and looking forward to the uh, engagement uh, process at the end of the talk. Um, just wanted to start the talk by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners on the land which UWA uh, is situated on the Noongar Wajuk people and pay my respects to their uh, elders past, present and emerging. So I wanted to start off just a little sort of quick introduction so you can understand a little bit about uh, what I do at UWA. And as Kirsty sort of mentioned, I'm both a, a lecturer and a researcher and really interested uh, in how we use a whole range of different technologies in, in sensing, remote sensing, uh, to answer a whole pile of questions. So a real focus on um, where my own research lies is really uh, like uh, Kirsty said, I'm a physical ge geographer. So really physical geography is about studying these key environmental processes uh, that operate within landscapes and also the way that humans interact with them. And that's, I guess, what defines geography as opposed to things like environmental sciences, which are much more the technical understanding of the processes. So I'm interested in big sort of changes. So how people and climates change and particularly interested in hydrology and water resources and geomorphology or the way that landscapes form and the processes that control landscapes. And so a really big part of uh, sort of my work and some of the research, you can see some of the partners that I work with across a whole range of different uh, areas um, is using these what we call novel and emerging techniques. So things like drones, and that's a big part of uh, what I do in my own research. And we've also got some of that that we uh, include in some of the teaching programs uh, at UWA. And um, using those technologies and techniques, we've got this remote sensing uh, platform. So platforms at UWA are basically facilities that provide infrastructure for researchers or also for, uh, for students who are maybe undertaking research projects. Um, and so we've got a whole pile of equipment related to re remote sensing and drones. And also more broadly, so using different sorts of sensing techniques. And you see a little photo there on the left-hand side of the screen that's this distributed temperature sensing. So using optic fibre cable to measure temperature. And I'll talk a little bit about that. It's another, you know, one of these more, more interesting novel sort of techniques that we can use. So really, um, you know, for me, these big picture global questions, there's always a, a, a spatial data uh, element to them in understanding environmental processes and people and solving these these big problems and so that's where I wanted to come at this um, this uh, session at so you know really in in broad terms remote sensing uh, is just you know encompassing a huge range of different sorts of techniques which are really about collecting information or data about something by sensing so using you know, computers uh, and, and equipment that measures some sort of attribute uh, when you're not in contact with it. And broadly, you know, this means that we're talking about a huge range of different sorts of things. So they can be active or passive sensors in terms of whether they've got their own energy source or whether they're using the sun's energy to be able to measure things. And really it fits also within this uh, whole area, which we'd, we'd talk about being uh, 
uh, sort of earth observation. So we're using remote sensing techniques to study these big picture questions, climate change, water resources, uh, coral bleaching and climate change uh, influences on the ocean. All of these sort of fit within this broader topic of, of earth observation. When we think about remote sensing, we might often think about satellites or drones have become super popular nowadays, but sensing is a much broader field and remote sensing can include a whole pile of other techniques. So one of them is this distributed temperature sensing, and that's a, a, an interesting one. I just sort of uh, talked about that briefly before, but really what it does is it's one of these more active methods. So you can get a laser pulse and send it down optic fiber cable and, and measure temperature. So Sensing can be a whole range of different things and we can collect different sorts of data with different sensors. This uh, uh, little diagram on the right hand side shows different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we might be collecting data in the visible light range, uh, we might be collecting it down in the microwave range or all sorts of different information that we can collect across this uh, sort of spectrum. And that's only one type of data we could also collect uh, other sorts of, uh, of um, information using sensors. So it's not just necessarily satellites and using the sun's reflected light uh, to, uh, to undertake remote sensing. So remote sensing is a really big, really broad field. And there's a whole pile of different techniques uh, and methods. So um, sorry to sort of disillusion anyone who's, who's planning a career in, in, uh, in drone flying, but as you can see here, these um, primates are doing a very good job of managing to control the drone themselves. So um, what I would say is that, um, you know, drones are one technique and, and one thing that we do come across, I guess, is a whole pile of, of different types of what we call platforms or ways of, of moving a sensor through a landscape or collecting data. And you can see these images here move from uh, the very close to ground to the very far away from ground from uh, methods that, uh, you know, my friend refers to uh, affectionately as camera on a stick. You can see uh, an image there of me just using a, a painter's pole to uh, hold a, a multi-spectral sensor above the ground to collect some information there. Equally, we might use autonomous self-driving vehicles to navigate through uh, landscapes that might be a really appropriate way to move a sensor through a landscape. Drones obviously have become quite popular and, and drones can form a whole range of things right the way through to these super light micro drones that can weigh a couple of hundred grams. Right the way through, there's an example here of a, a drone that, uh, that NASA used, which is effectively a civilian going version of a, of a military drone, but you know, at the cost of about 250 million uh, dollars. So, you know, they can be, you know, quite substantial and quite expensive platforms. And then obviously right the way through to satellites and, and satellites form a whole pile of different types. So there's a couple uh, here that I've just illustrated with those uh, diagrams, which in terms of, uh, you know, ones that are using maybe uh, light and lasers to measure height. So uh, radar altimeters here, radar altimeters here measuring the height of water. Um, or maybe we're collecting land surface land cover information. Uh, so it's really important in this field to really understand um, how different types of platforms and different types of sensor are going to collect different types of data and understanding how that data might answer your question depending on what it is. So one thing we start to, uh, to think about within this sort of geography and GIS spatial data sort of area is understanding when we apply different platforms and sensors to collecting data, what sort of data we're going to get to answer our questions. And so I put up here a couple of different diagrams of, of some work. Um, this one here on the left hand side is related to um, looking at coral bleaching and other sorts of uh, events within the marine environment. But thinking about the different sorts of scales that we might like to study things on. So, you know, we use traditional methods like, like diver based methods, and that can include collecting remotely sensed data by divers just swimming across, you know, a little area of reef, really looking at the micro scale of corals, which is going to be really important for understanding them and how they work and change. 
right the way through to we might want to try and collect data across the entire Great Barrier Reef to understand how the reef's responding to threats like climate change or crown of thorn starfish or responding to nutrient runoff uh, and, and turbidity um, and, and other sorts of stresses. So really this question about different remote sense data, there's no single type of data that we can use. And this principle applies right the way across agriculture, marine, environmental questions, all of these really is about understanding things like the size of the data or the pixel size, the scale, the area that it's covered, and also the frequency. And this is something that's constantly changing and evolving. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm just gonna play a short video here from one of our PhD students. He's gonna talk a little bit about uh, his work in this area. So Dan, you're working uh, for your PhD using uh, spatial data. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the sort of spatial data that you're using and the sort of skills that you need to do that? Sure. Uh, so I use GIS and remote sensing pretty much every day. And uh, we work with data from many different scales. And that means looking at maybe images from small fields with drones or from collected from satellites. Well, I think today there's no absence of data. I think there's so much data available to us and most, a lot of it's free. It's out there. You can just go and download it. But to have the kind of programming and geospatial statistical tools to be able to interrogate the data, not everybody has that. Uh, and so that's where the imbalance is. And I think um, taking advantage of those tools, mainly programming and dealing with big data, like time series. So yeah, I think Dan makes some really good good points there and sort of highlights some of that work. And, and this is some of his work on the right hand side here and, and looking at different sorts of methods. So he's trying to look and understand how climate change is changing uh, flowering patterns of vegetation in, in the southwest of Western Australia. So he could do this with a whole pile of different technologies, techniques, different sorts of satellites, but understanding how frequently they uh, uh, sort of uh, revisit areas, the scale that they cover, all of these different compromises and niches uh, is really important to answering his question. And it's something I'll talk about in a second, but this is also changing and, and has changed dramatically over the last few years. So remote sensing often collects these very rich, what we'd call data cubes. So data cubes are data that's got all these different dimensions. So here's a good example of some data, which has basically been stacked up in a cube. And you can start to think about how complex and, and large these data sets and time series uh, start to get. So, you know, when I certainly started off in this area, we might get one or two, you know, images of an area, whereas now things have changed quite, quite significantly. We can get really frequent uh, data, and this maybe exists across an area, and so that's, if you like, that sort of flat plane in the diagram, but also these data sets can be stacked up over time, uh, and then they also might include a whole pile of different information. So for example, satellite information, we might have seven or nine different bands of information that might tell us different, uh, different things. So you can start to appreciate the data uh, gets very large, but really, really powerful. So one of the lecturers uh, at UWA, Shireen Hickey, Dr. Shireen Hickey, uh, she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about um, some of her work and, and some of the skill sets and things that she uh, sees as uh, very important in this area. So Shireen, the people that you work with, what skills do you sort of use and what sorts of questions do you um, find that you're able to answer with your uh, background in GIS and remote sensing? Yeah, so I use my um, GIS remote sensing background to look at the marine coastal environment, so look, to look at changes and drivers of what changes. So mainly looking using satellites. So the benefit of using satellites is that we can monitor anywhere in the world. So we can see if what we see on one coastline, for instance, or on the WA coast, is also occurring um, elsewhere in the world. At the moment, it's quite interesting. It's a lot of the skill sets are around coding and being able to code, but also understanding that data. So lots of people, coding is quite important. It's being taught in different areas of the university, but the 
with the GIS side is that having that geography and that understanding of spatial data, because all of our data, we can collect it, but it all has a location. So understanding that location and being able to integrate that with the different data that we get. Yeah, it's been interesting. I guess through part of mine, we've seen Landsat come become open data source for having freely available data, but also having nano satellites and drones being having so much more data available is definitely something that I've seen across uh, since when I started my undergrad till now. Um, and just having that amount of data means we can do so much more analysis um, with it. So I think a lot of the, that skill set is, that probably has changed is around being able to use coding to do that, but also it still has that same basis in geography. So understanding the geographical concepts is still really important. Yeah, so I think Shirin, you know, is, is um, sort of flagging some really interesting things. So really the way that data, you know, certainly um, agree with what she said there, the way that it's changed, she's got much more powerful time series, but then the skill set that we need to do that has probably changed. Whereas before we might have done a lot of manual uh, processing because of the amount and the volume of data that we've got, we've really needed to um, develop and change um, and, and develop these skills in, in coding to be able to automate a lot of the processes. I think the other thing that she's flagged that's really important within this is this idea of understanding the fundamentals. So down here, I've kind of summarized a whole pile of different sort of questions or, or problems or challenges with geographic data. So understanding things like, you know, the, the way or the scale at which you represent or resample data spatially can have a really huge impact on, on your data set, the way that you um, project data sets, overlap data sets, um, represent and sample data sets, all of these really fundamental geographical ideas, even right down to uh, what's called Tobler's first law of geography, this you know, rather simplistic but, but fundamentally deep sort of statement that you know, everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Understanding those you know, kind of geographic principles and ideas is really fundamental. So if you're an ecologist or a biologist or someone else who's picking up a geographic data, which is increasingly easy, easy to do, really important that, you know, you're also balancing those fundamentals. So um, again, those fundamentals uh, remain really core to, to understanding uh, what you're trying to do. And then thinking back to those other past slides. So thinking about the right technology uh, for the, um, for the question. So one of the things I certainly come across uh, a lot is people saying, Oh, I've just gone out and bought a drone. I'm trying to think about how I can solve my problem with the drone. Whereas what we really, um, I guess, encourage students to do with, within our courses and, and encouraging our, our PhD students and we do in our own research is really to say, well, here's my question. What types of data do I need? How frequently, what size, what scale, and then what's the right technique? So, you know, really I'd say, you know, a core thing is understanding these principles and driving solving big global problems from the question of the problem, not the not from the perspective of the tool or the technique. So I think that's a really important one that um, is, uh, is, is important to keep in, in your mind. So I think Shireen um, did a really nice job uh, flagging some of these. And I've got a sort of great example from some of her work that, uh, that I know of. Um, so for example, you know, with this uh, availability of Landsat, for example, uh, and also things like cloud computing capabilities. So she's got a fantastic paper that she published from a couple of years ago, and she pulled down and downloaded a whole pile of different scenes and, and balanced them and adjusted them for the impacts of atmosphere. So she could do, you know, a nice time series analysis of how mangroves are responding to, um, to, to, to change and, and then the implications of stored carbon within those mangrove ecosystems, which is really important. That took her about eight months to do that work. To give you an idea about sort of four or five years later now, because of the power of open Landsat and platforms, cloud computing platforms like Google Earth Engine that store all of that data, the work that took her eight months to complete she can now complete that in 15 seconds. So that's the sort of nature of how um, some of these cloud computing platforms have, have revolutionized and changed things. So things like Google Earth Engine store a massive archive of different uh, remotely sensed data sets, 
on their engine and then have this computational power that you know just you know allows you on a on a you know couple of hundred dollar laptop in in any country in the world uh, to connect in and to utilize that capability so where universities were investing millions and millions of dollars in high performance computing to answer these big global problems um, things like cloud computing platforms in the last you know three to four years have just revolutionized this area the other thing that we started to see you know certainly when i started off um, you know, it was a lot of proprietary software. So things like um, Esri really had locked up the market in uh, GIS software. So really open access software. So things like the QGIS program, which is really fantastic. And also uh, geospatial capability within um, things like Python and R are really, really powerful. So really we've also fundamentally shifted in that you know, GIS and spatial data is now a lot more accessible to people. So money, uh, to some degree, has become not so much of a barrier. And that's been a really important development. The other ones that we've seen have been um, this um, sort of uh, changing of the nature of, of, of collection of satellite data. So in the past, you know, we'd have very large uh, research programs, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of government funding to build very dedicated high quality satellites, things like the Landsat platforms or the Sentinel platforms, you know, requiring huge amounts of cooperation and, and, and funding and really centrally driven. That business model only in the last, again, couple of years has really been flipped on its head. So things like nano satellite clusters have really revolutionized this area. And these are more kind of uh, private companies that are investing in um, a different way of collecting data. So instead of launching one single satellite that collects a whole pile of information, uh, so Planet, for example, have, have launched a nanosatellite cluster that allows us to collect data every single day. So where methods before gave us data every couple of weeks, now we can get it uh, every day. And then to give you an idea again, how this whole area is, is changing again, you can actually now uh, go online and design and get built your own nano satellite. Uh, and then you can also go online to another provider, uh, this uh, uh, rocket lab uh, down the bottom right hand side, and you can actually book in uh, a launch and uh, send it over to New Zealand and they'll pop it up into space for you. So if you've got about, you know, something in the order of 100, 150,000 Australian dollars, uh, you can, uh, you know, go and uh, launch your own satellite now. So this sort of capability was, was not even, even dreamed of. The other thing we've had ha happened, uh, and particularly within Australia, is um, Australia probably getting a bit more um, um, sort of catching up and, and was maybe a bit of sleep at the wheel. But the Australian Space Agency uh, has been established in the last couple of years and really looking at building the sovereign space capability. And this is something that's being repeated right the way across the world. And that's within dedicated space agencies or within the way that the sort of diversification, commercialization, um, openness and freeness of data has really allowed different people across every part of the developed and developing world to be able to access huge amounts of, of spatial data. And you know, something that continues to change dramatically. We've also seen obviously with drones, uh, they've become really quite, uh, quite popular. Um, and, and really revolutionise the way that we can go out to particular areas. We can be in control of collecting uh, data ourselves, you know, where we want it to, to, to collect it at particular, you know, high resolution uh, and, and over modest sorts of areas. And I guess with drones and with a whole pile of those other uh, technologies, it's trying to understand where they're, um, where they're going. So I really like this quote from The Economist that says, trying to predict where drones uh, are going at the moment is a bit like trying to forecast, you know, for example, what mobile phones were going to be like in the 1980s. And to sort of put this in into the context of a mobile phone, um, we're at the point where we haven't even invented, you know, relatively cheap consumer phones. Uh, and it took us basically 25 years to invent the modern smartphone from the first origins of, um, you know, of commercial mobile phones. So we're sitting at around about the 10 year mark for um, commercialising uh, drone usage. 
So really this, these other sorts of methods um, are rapidly changing and are, are fundamentally shifting the way that we go about, um, you know, how we go about solving these, these big global problems. And, you know, where before, you know, there was quite a modest uh, number of jobs, you know, the drone industry is, is predicted to, you know, grow by billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars over the next few years. And there are, are jobs and opportunities there that never existed across a whole range of areas. And that, they might be for people that want to design the drones, the hardware and the software systems within them, and the robotics and systems integration type people, uh, people that are going out and collecting drone data, although I've already flagged that as, as being not, not the major part of the question, but really in more the um, you know, drone sort of logistics area, but then really those, those core areas. So GIS, spatial data, remote sensing, you know, developing the workflows and the smarts to get data out of drones. It's, it's very, very simple to go and fly a drone. It's quite complex uh, to get really good usable data to answer your questions out of a drone. That is certainly the, the trickiest part of the operation. If you can play a PlayStation, you can fly a drone, but uh, not necessarily everyone has the right skill set and background to be able to, to process that. So that's really where, um, you know, developing your skill set uh, can be really important. So I wanted to sort of flag some of the sort of different scales or, or ranges of questions, some of the stuff that I work on and, and happy to sort of return to these. But you know, it's a real big question right the way across the world, uh, within Australia, other continents, um, where we've got very large dry land Areas. So dry land areas, the um, potential evaporation is much greater than rainfall. And so we have really acute water stress in these areas, but we don't necessarily have um, the data to understand those water resources. And so this foundational paper here really um, set, in, in, uh, set out a whole pile of challenges that we, we sit um, sort of facing and that we're still trying to work to to you know, provide industry with the tools to, to solve problems about water. Um, but really, um, you know, there's some really nice stuff that we've uh, been working on doing, taking data from um, satellites, using that to make, in this case down the bottom here, predictions of, of water level without any uh, water level data whatsoever. The other thing is starting to do really sort of interesting stuff in trying to get, again, satellite data and calibrate hydrological models that tell us where water is in the landscape and how much uh, is driving whole polar ecological questions uh, and things like that by using remotely sensed data. So again, these are questions that we just didn't have any uh, ability to answer and a fundamental, you know, right the way across you know, things like providing solutions to the mining industry uh, on, you know, where they should put, you know, billions of dollars of, of infrastructure, right the way through to addressing challenges set out by the United Nations and then right the way into things like the sustainable development goals around water and how that underpins a whole pile of things. So this distributed temperature sensing is another sort of interesting area. Again, it uses these pulses of light down optic fiber cables. Uh, but in this case, we, uh, you know, did some, some sort of pretty cool research. Here's a picture of Bonnie Stutzel, one of the PhD students. So she uh, and, and we sort of went out and built this basically 3.6 kilometer long fence of optic fiber cable through, through crops to measure frost events and try and better understand frost events and how they work. And, and try and address something that, that costs, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in, in lost production. Some work on the right hand side here with some fire ecologists. So using these really cool emerging techniques, putting optic fiber cable uh, through soil and understanding how things like different litter loads uh, affect uh, temperature in soil and survival of plant species, uh, how weed species are affected by the fire regime. You know, how do we uh, control uh, burning uh, in, in landscapes and how do we use that and, and how do we look at things like, you know, the big issues of bushfires that we had within Australia that uh, happened within, you know, much of, of the sort of drier parts of North America, South America and Europe um, and, and, and understand these sorts of processes. So again, you know, really important, the spatial data, the temporal data and using a sensing um, to, um, to use that. Um, 
Well, one here of some of the work we've been doing in more alpine landscapes. So in this case, a whole pile of data that's collected at one specific location. So in this case, what's the depth of snow? It doesn't necessarily relate to the depth of snow right the way across these alpine regions. And these sorts of areas are really important globally. So around about 20% of the world's population relies on water that runs off from seasonal snowpacks. Um, annually and, and faces this problem. And within Australia, it's a pretty huge one. So about a third of the renewable energy to the east coast of Australia comes out of the Snowy Hydro Scheme. Uh, there's a huge number, thousands of irrigators, but understanding the actual quantity of water and how climate change uh, is impacting this isn't just a matter of going out and measuring snow or looking at the long-term records. Because in fact, those long-term records have got a whole pile of spatial bias uh, problems, fundamental geographical problems with the data set that mean you can't just take that data set and do those analysis. So again, there's this really important element to understanding the data and what's sitting behind it. Uh, here's another one. This is using a drone with a thermal camera. We can develop these complex uh, thermal maps of uh, ecosystems. In this case, we've got different types of tree species, some eucalypt species, banksia species, uh, some others. And, and looking at the temperature of, of those species and how they respond to things like water stress and drought stress, trying to understand really fundamentally critical question of in a globally warming climate and in this really important ecosystem that's uh, listed as, as threatened, um, what is it that drives the decline? Is it hot events or is it the water stress and or the combination of those? So really the scale at which in this case drone data can, can help us answer something is really um, changed uh, change things dramatically. So I wanted to kind of wrap these up uh, um, a little bit. I've got um, one last little sort of interview here I did with Ben Radford. He works for the Australian Institute of Marine Science and also UWA He's involved in our teaching programs and asked him to sort of talk a little bit about what he does, but also for example, some of the graduates that he employs, what skill set uh, does he look for in those? Ben, you work with um, AIMS, the Australian Institute of Marine Science. You're also involved with the University of WA. Tell us a little bit about how you use spatial data and sort of questions you're answering. Yeah, Nick, so uh, we use spatial data implicitly for all our, our, question, our questions around things like climate change. So, for example, looking at temperature events, looking at changes on coral reefs, using things like rain shifts, so that's changing of communities in response to these sort of climatic level uh, changes. Uh, also how that interacts with, with people, so that can be industry, it can be different bits of planning, um, so it's really fundamental for decision support. So really everything we do with spatial data uh, eventually feeds into that decision support space. Good question. So there's a, been a couple of big changes, one of which is that is the amount of data that we now have to access. So I do a lot of work in the satellite space. So we've gone from having data once a month to having satellite information daily, which has made a, that's been a huge acceleration in data. And to deal with that, we've had to go to online processing. So a lot of the work we do now is not done on desktops or laptops, it's done online things like Google Earth Engine or Amazon Tools. Uh, and to be able to do that, we've had to go, we've had basically had to learn to program. So a lot of what we do now, or a lot of our analysis is done with with one and one programming languages. So we, we may have not done computing science in the past, but that's a big uh, interplay uh, with, what, with our geography and our spatial analysis. Fundamentals haven't changed, and that's really what, uh, uh, that's the difference between a spatial scientist or spatial data scientist and a data scientist, is that you still need to understand all the fundamentals around spatial analysis, geography, these ideas around scale, both in space and time. They're still, they haven't changed. So that's really, that, the sort of nexus is, is the fundamentals, and then these new technologies and these new, new modeling approaches, it's basically bringing them all together. So to make sure you still have robust and meaningful results uh, uh, at the end. I actually have employed a number of the graduates myself. I think it's a combination of things. I think that uh, it's good, good theoretical knowledge. It's also this ability, the, the kind of analytical skills, the ability to, to process and be quite flexible with, with analytical skills and process a lot of data. But I think that one real fundamental that hasn't changed is this, this ability to basically describe, uh, analyze uh, and communicate 
your results uh, in a really meaningful math manner. So it's a combination of the old skills of actually theoretically understanding what you're doing and have good good communication skills, but being able to combine that with the analysis skills that, that are now commonly needed and commonplace. I think that in today's job market and academic market, I think having analytical skills is really key. Uh, you're never going to not benefit from having some basic programming languages, some analytical, uh, some analytical background or some analytical courses, and being able to do things online as well. I think is really is really important, and that really enhances whatever other thing that you're really passionate about. You can always bring those those skills to uh, to any any sort of either job or or project or, or course that you're using at university. I think the other thing about them is those skills are quite universal and, and you may go through many different types of uh, career trajectories uh, or particular projects and you can apply them and, and enhance them at each stage. But um, yeah, they're really fundamental. Yeah, so I think Ben sort of brought a whole pile of the themes that we've talked about in the, uh, in the seminar together. So really here, I, I want to sort of end off on things and I'll throw it across to, to Kirsty in a second. So, you know, I think there's a whole pile of different things that you can do um, if you're interested in this area, if you've got some skills or you uh, want to develop some skills. I think there's a whole pile of different uh, free tools and opportunities to drive your own learning if you want to. Um, I've certainly uh, learned a hell of a lot watching YouTube videos and, uh, and, and playing with things and finding a problem and throwing myself at it. Um, so things like Python, I think, are really fundamental and some of those uh, geospatial packages and, and using and getting familiar with that um, uh, are really helpful. Um, using things like QGIS, you can download that. You've got a whole working GIS system. You don't need to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in, in, in fees to access really high quality uh, GIS software nowadays. Uh, Google Earth Engine, again, is, is free to learn how to use that. It's an amazingly powerful uh, tool. We use it a lot in our research and, you know, you can develop those skills uh, yourself. Again, some self-guided uh, work. Um, using packages for, for processing different data sets, you know, either collecting your own data, if you happen to have a drone yourself, or you can actually go to the manufacturer's website. So a whole pile of uh, different manufacturers actually provide trial data sets. So go and grab those data sets, go and grab a demonstration version of some of the software packages uh, and actually just, you know, start to develop the skills to, uh, to process yourself. Um, the other things would be, you know, just trying to understand, um, you know, the spatial data. We've talk, talked a lot about, you know, you can go out and all of these things are free and they're, and they're out there, but developing the smarts to understand how to use this stuff appropriately is really where it, uh, where it lies. So, you know, that might be, um, you know, if you're within, you know, sort of UWA or some sort of other university environment, you know, there's a huge range of different options. And that might be right the way within a sort of, you know, actual geography, GIS, spatial sciences sort of area. Uh, and we've got a whole pile of range of options within the undergraduate and postgraduate pro, uh, um, sort of areas um, into some of the more data sciences and electronic, mechatronic engineering areas, uh, or in very applied sense. So things like our agricultural science and agricultural technology specializations in our uh, undergrad and master's programs, again at UWA. So these are you know, more in an applied context. So looking at agriculture or looking at a particular area, but looking at those you know, techniques, things like precision agriculture is gonna need all that data, uh, but you know, doing it in an applied uh, sense. So really, yeah, that's that's about it. I'll throw it back to Kirsty to uh, to coordinate things, and um, yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. It's been really super opportunity. That was awesome. Thanks, Nick. I love getting a deep dive on some areas that I'm not so familiar with. Um, I especially found it interesting that last uh, slide with Ben on there. The um, the resolution that you had on that reef there being someone who does diving and stuff, you can actually see like individual colonies of coral and being able to get that uh, now, as opposed to, you know, back in the yet heyday, it was, you know, what you remembered, what you were measuring when you were under the water, then we've got to a point where we we're able to take pictures, which is still quite two dimensional. And now we're in a place where we can actually create these 3d images and, um, you know, we are out in the field and being able to get them, but then we can also analyze them to a much more rigorous standard back in, um, 
back in our offices in the comforts yeah. of the home. <laughs> I think the interesting one that goes with that question is, you know, anyone can go and grab a camera and take overlapping photos on a reef environment now. And then it's also that skill set to put it together to understand some of those challenges of managing the geographic data. So you can then answer the really cool, you know, applied marine biology, marine ecology, you know, climate change sorts of questions on those, on those systems. But yeah, the, the scale of data, you know, you're talking millimeter pixel, three dimensional reconstruction of reef environments and then yeah, being able to monitor how individual colonies and individual species are maybe responding to a bleaching event. So yeah. The, the capabilities now, you know, that you can do, you couldn't even answer that question three or five years ago. No, yeah. no, you couldn't. We were doing much more broader stroke kind of uh, conclusions without the technology, but as it seems like we're, the technology is now caught up and we need to catch up to the technology or invent something that's going to help us to catch up to the technology. Yeah. All right. We're going to get Super. to some questions. We're going to get to some questions, um, guys. So uh, we've got a question in there. So this is more in that agriculture uh, specific area. What do you see as being the most important uses of kind of remote sensing technology in agriculture, especially in countries or areas where, you know, being able to use the land for different agricultural purposes is difficult? Um, and the question was also asked, can you use the technology to fix soil by controlling plants? But I guess it's more knowing what are we at, what information are we actually getting from this technology in those kind of spaces? Yeah, I think you know, the, the agriculture space is really sort of rich and ripe uh, for this. And that exists across a whole pile of different um, sort of scales, if you like, in terms of like big broadacre farming through to you know, intensive horticulture. I think you've got different um, types of farming systems. So within say Western Australia, for example, we're talking a lot about you know, large grain farming operations where we've got access now to um, tractors that have precision agriculture capability. And we can do really interesting things like vary the amount of herbicides and fertilizers that we use. We can be a lot smarter about that. But the gap that we've got, we've got the capability in the tractors, we don't have the ability to actually tell the tractors what to do. In more developed environment countries, I think you can do some really you know, interesting stuff you know, across a whole range of things. So some of these you know, cloud computing platforms, for example, you know, before it was really difficult to access a lot of you know, time series data to look at land cover change or to look at you know, productivity uh, of land, understanding, um, you know, how, you know, land was productive through different droughts or, or understanding, you know, different uh, technologies. So really, you know, I'd kind of almost throw the question back on, 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 uh, on itself in, in terms of, I think you can answer any question. Um, some questions are more suitable than others, but it's then thinking through the types of data, is it satellite data or is it drone data or on ground data? and utilising these uh, technologies and techniques and understanding, you know, how to, how to use them. Yeah, and I guess what this, um, what this space is allowing us to do is that concept of work smarter and not harder, being able to create better management to the practices that we want to do. And um, I really liked how you mentioned that you get the students or your new, if any new project to, okay, what's your question? What's the best way we're going to be able to answer that question? Let's not just go out and get a plethora of data and then figure out how we're going to answer the question. Let's be much more systematic about it in thinking about how we get that. Also understanding, you know, remote sensing t techniques or, you know, using a drone, for example, might actually not be able to answer your question. So trying to understand, yeah, which, which, which techniques are going to, are, are going to benefit. Yeah. Okay, I've um, got another question here. The ability to use remote sensing to measure rates of carbon sequestration towards moving toward that net zero emissions within our state climate policy, specific for WA as 92% is not is Crown land. So that potential there is massive. So do you know of any work that's being done in that space? Yeah, well, Shireen that we uh, had the interview with is more more um, sort of in, in the coastal environment, but uh, the nice little pic picture behind me uh, here of one of uh, field sites that I've worked on with her up in, uh, in um, 
Exmouth uh, looking at sequestration of carbon of, of, uh, uh, of carbon in, in mangrove environments. And that's certainly something that Shirin's been uh, working on as a focus of her research. I guess the question's more, more focus on the, uh, on the rangelands and, and those sorts of areas. So again, yeah, the um, capability to do land cover, land surface um, assessments, looking at land condition and monitoring that over time and then trying to understand that is a huge potential. And obviously the markets for carbon and biodiversity farming have started to mature um, and some really important uh, opportunities there. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, there's certainly a, a focus uh, and, and a huge opportunity to develop those methods to do those sort of greenhouse gas and carbon accounting um, works and, and monitoring land cover, um, depending upon, you know, those sorts of things, whether they're local markets, whether it's, um, you know, accounting for biodiversity offsets that people might be engaging in, people, uh, you know, looking at uh, carbon farming opportunities, or, um, you know, just accounting for whether Australia is meeting our uh, international obligations uh, around, uh, you know, carbon and, and, and other emissions and, and related to land cover change, yeah. Yeah, so um, for those of you that weren't in the room last week, we actually had uh, Marit, Kr Marit Krag uh, and she spoke a little bit about carbon farming and she comes from it from a much more, uh, she's, a, she's an economist, an environmental economist, so she comes from that angle. So she works closely with um, the scientists when coming up with those kind of uh, economical ideas around the whole idea of carbon farming and being able to use the data that people like Nick and others um, come up with to uh, provide information into that. So I guess we've, we've probably, we did have a, um, while you were answering that last question, we had another one come through that asked about the prediction of um, uptake of greenhouse gas emission monitoring using satellite data. So that's um, something that's already in practice. Yeah, I can see, see there's also a follow-up one also talking about CO2, NOx and, and methane emissions and things like that. So again, it's using these different types of, of methods. So um, Jason Berenger, who's within our, our school here at UWA, for example, he runs a, a flux tower uh, and is actually the director of, of a group called uh, Ausflux. So Ausflux is a series of flux towers. Flux towers are measuring basically the exchange of a whole pile of gases and, and, and things from the land surface to the in environment. Um, and that's really these very detailed sensing of, of point measurements. Uh, and then remote sensing is certainly able to look at some of those different uh, elements of, you know, CO2 emissions, um, and uh, yeah, and, and so it's, if you look at um, people who are interested, you can look at LEAP, L-E-A-P is Jason's uh, network of flux tower sites. There's some really cool stuff um, out there with that. So, you know, remote sensing is about basically being able to sense or measure often some surrogate. So things like uh, land cover change, where we can understand that um, directly, uh, trying to understand and sense, you know, NOx or, or methane emissions directly, um, you know, it can be done with, with sensors, but doing it with, with big, large scale uh, uh, sort of remote sensing platforms, but certainly, you know, the capability and needing to do that and understand it, you know, understanding, you know, emissions from, you know, different land surface cover types, dams, reservoirs, um, you know, our, our farming land, you know, uh, livestock and grain operations, all of these things across the Australian uh, landscape is really critical to, to understanding and addressing, you know, climate change uh, in, as, a, as a partner in, in the globe. Yeah, so making um, observations at that micro scale and applying them to a macro scale is really important. You can't, again, broad brush strokes isn't going to give us answers. We need to understand local environments as well. Yeah, it's being able to dance between those different scales of saying, you know, we might need, you know, flux towers that are measuring a very limited area, but give it huge amounts of understanding of the processes and then trying to scale that across the whole of Australia using other surrogates that have been remotely sensed at that continental scale. So yeah. certainly the potential's there. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So for those of you not, um, very familiar with the Australian landscape or the size of Australia, <laughs> where we are basically, um, how many, is it like the size of France, Germany, basically the whole of main, mainland Europe um, is how we compare ourselves or um, similar to the stretch across the United States again, but only a population of minuscule amount compared to those areas uh, and mainly populate 
populated around the coastline. So um, we're in Perth, which is on the west coast. Uh, for those who might have heard of Melbourne and Sydney, they're over on the east coast, uh, currently three hours behind us in the time zone. So yeah, we're a huge country with a very varied uh, types of environment that we are monitoring and helping to make these, um, these conversations happen. I'll grab one. Are you reading Richard's question? Uh, I am. Can't yeah. answer the coral question in, in detail on the south side of Rottnest, but if you're interested, Richard, I could uh, put you in some contact with some uh, people that might be able to. But certainly, you know, real-time sea surface temperatures, um, you know, for tourists or, or, for, or for anyone, you know, understanding that, you know, marine ecology, you know, understanding in real time where, you know, bleaching events are happening, you know, we can, you know, got a much better understanding of, of prediction, you know, I'm, I'm not, a, not a marine person, but certainly work with those people, but you know, the capability now to understand where sea surface temperatures are tracking uh, and understand and, and, and to kind of foreshadow some of those big bleaching events is now pretty um, unprecedented. You know, understanding the ocean currents and how they interact with climate, um, you know, being able to sense big, big um, oceanic you know, changes, things like the Indian Ocean Dipole and La Nina, El Nino events uh, in real time, uh, that we can inform climate models. We know that these are really, uh, really important, the you know, sort of climate patterns that we've entered uh, into, particularly in the east of Australia. Um, you know, would suggest our, our summer this summer is not going to be as bad as the last one in terms of being very dry, uh, very hot and severe bushfire risk. So some of these things, you know, really, um, you know, really sort of capable, certainly different remote sensing techniques being used uh, to answer a whole pile of questions. So you're talking about sort of marine uh, sort of megafauna, things like humpback whale migration. So Ben talked a little bit in that video about looking at, at, at rain shifts and and in a whole pile of things from, you know, humpback in, in the marine environment, for example, you know, from humpback whales, you know, um, large shark species, whale sharks, you know, through to sort of kelp beds, uh, corals, uh, and looking and analysing these rain shift uh, patterns, um, you know, understanding that, understanding some of the other variables that might be driving it becomes, uh, you know, really, uh, really powerful uh, ways to start to understand the processes as well. Yeah, so I've just popped a couple of um, links into the chat for everybody. Um, the last two that I've linked in there, NOAA, N-O-A-A, is a really great um, international source of data. Um, so if you are just interested in your local um, local <laughs> sea surface temperatures, um, NOAA actually provides uh, data that you can look at and analyse yourselves at different scales. And then I've also popped in a um, link to a another online session that we did earlier this year with um, another UWA academic, Jeff Hansen, where he talks about um, marine and coastal uh, movement. So he looks at um, coastal processes along the different coastlines and he has a great example in that talk about how they were really uh, lucky enough to um, grab the uh, an event that happened here in May where we had a huge storm come through and you can actually see those changes um, immediately from some, some uh, photographic data that he got along the WA coastline. So pop them in there. I also linked in the Ausflux um, and LEAP websites that uh, Nick mentioned for one of our other academics, Jason Beringer and his group um, of where they're doing. So I've got a, got a question in the, in the chat there from, uh, who is it? It's Edward in Zambia. So hello to Edward out there uh, in, a, in a dry land location and just saying, um, I've seen areas that had water or so 15 years a go of dry lands now and buildings are being erected. What effects will this uh, be? How do we reverse this going forwards? I mean, I think it's, you know, great question. You know, dry lands are really interesting places. Um, you know, Zambia, Australia, very similar sorts of things in terms of, you know, places that can have, be very wet at times and then be very dry. I don't know Zambia in detail, but within Australia, we even struggle to have enough data to, to look at um, questions around you know, water and where it covers, floods and those sort of flood risks. What we do know is that everywhere around the world is becoming increasingly more populated and unsurprisingly, we picked the, you know, the best and the safest spots to settle first. So people um, are being displaced and moved or, or choosing to shift into areas where they become vulnerable. So, 
you know, uh, within dry lands on floodplains and things like that. It's certainly something that we see and, and different uh, techniques. And that's a motivation for some of that work that we've done in trying to use different remote sensing techniques to try and measure these floods uh, or flood potential in, in areas and using different methods like satellite altimeters and, and different optical satellite platforms to try and pull in data to understand these questions where we just don't have that kind of raw on the ground observational uh, data. So it's a real big um, sort of challenge um, to try and address. Yeah. Um, yeah, another one in there, a follow up from Richard talking about how can we increase public access to the data? I, mean, I think we're getting a hell of a lot better than that at, at that. Um, and kind of foreshadowed a whole pile of those different tools. So, you know, if I look back, you know, five or 10 years ago, you know, you needed to be part of a university, you needed tens of thousands of dollars worth of software, and you had to pay for a lot of your satellite data. So, um, you know, this, you know, to a degree, I think we've moved a long way. I think governments have really come to the party in making a lot more of their data sets open uh, and, uh, and online. And um, I think that's really gone a long way to, um, you know, helping to address it. But, you know, now I think, you know, now, now more than ever, you know, the more of those tools are in, in people's hands and they can, uh, you know, those sort of list of, of, of different uh, options, you know, picking, picking up and learning Google Earth Engine, you know, you can go and, and, and analyze land cover change. In fact, there's data sets in there that people have already done all the, uh, the hard work for you. So there's a whole pile of questions you can go and answer that, again, you know, two, three years ago, you, you didn't have the data you didn't have the processing capability, you didn't have uh, access to licensing uh, to actually do these things. And, you know, it's really exciting that we've actually cracked the nut of a lot of these problems uh, and are continuing, and, and I can only see them improving from now, fingers crossed. Let's answer one last question. Um, there is one that's come in from uh, maybe in the Philippines, judging off their, uh, their question. So, um, he said, uh, thank you, it's an interesting topic, topic, and it's interesting how that this tech can actually play um, a role, a pivotal role in the agricultural sector. However, for developing countries such as the Philippines, where farmers hold only small areas of land, um, it may cost too much. Is that something, is there different ways that different technology is being used at a smaller scale to help um, the ag industry? Yeah, I think, um Again, things have changed and, 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 and different, you know, techniques or um, methods have really uh, come about. So um, for more small scale, you know, horticultural type, you know, uh, activities that are maybe more happening in those sort of wet tropical sorts of, uh, of areas. Um, it's really about thinking through this, this uh, way that we approach it. So thinking through your question. So, you know, what, what do you want to answer? You know, is it, you know, about productivity? Is it about what areas are being used by different crops or farms to understand that? And then think at the scale, are you talking about, you know, understanding a whole field or are you understanding, you know, like individual plants within fields? You know, do you need data that's a metre across or 30 metres across? And, you know, do you need data every day or once a week is fine? So really, you know, I'd say you can answer potentially any sort of question. So I'd I'd go back and, and, and work your way through that question and say, you know, what's, what do I want to know over what area? What scale of data am I going to need? And if you want to look at something, typically, you know, you might want three, four, maybe six pixels that cover an area. So if I want to look at a field, I don't just want one pixel that covers my, you know, 100 metre field. I might want pixels that are, you know, 20 or 30 metres across. And that will then say, well, you know, Landsat or Sentinel data might be really useful to answer that question. Or if it's at a much finer scale, there might be other satellites out there. And some of them are free and some of them are not free. Um, but I think, again, for, uh, you know, countries like the Philippines or, 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 or a whole range of other countries that maybe, you know, price uh, and, and access to, you know, computers to process it to the data sets, which has been a real obstacle uh, and certainly an obstacle even within Australia and, and for uh, a lot of the, you know, PhD students that we work with, you know, money is, is very difficult to, uh, to, to fund. So, you know, a lot of the innovation is being driven by, by people and a lot of uh, the effort that's being put into um, developing these tools uh, is very much under the spirit of open access uh, to the data, to the software tools. Uh, and this is probably really the exciting area that we've now, 
you know, got tools and got capability at, at, at free or, or very, very low cost that, um, again, three, five years ago, you never would have had won the computational capability or, um, or the, um, or, or, or the funds and, and resources to answer these questions. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. a super exciting area. Yeah, it's amazing. I will, uh, there is one last question that I do want to yeah. get your answer on, uh -huh. just aware of who the audience might be in the room. Yeah. Uh, what can the WA government do to help develop applications of remote sensing in WA? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, within the uh, the Landgate uh, group, uh, there's certainly, uh, you know, capability and, and some expertise within uh, the WA government. Um, the WA government, you know, the people that I know that I work with across a whole range of different agencies, you know, the Department of Primary Industries, regional development, um, particularly in the agriculture space, but I also know in the marine space, uh, in Department of Water Environmental Regulation, Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attraction, all of these state government agencies have some really amazing staff that have fantastic skill sets um, in it. I think um, you know, there's really good uh, opportunities. Um, yeah, I think we could do uh, do a lot more. I think, you know, providing, you know, more resourcing. I think the, at what a WA and local state government um, buying in and, and partnering with things like the Australian Space Agency is a really exciting uh, opportunity. So, you know, we've got the opportunity in the next five or 10 years to decide what are the questions we want to answer and go and design and launch our own satellites that we want to, uh, to do this instead of just relying on all the other things that, that uh, other people have put into space. So, you know, the, uh, the whole area is really opening up. It, it's a case of, of having the, um, you know, a, a bit of... Um, sort of uh, entrepreneurial sort of spirit, a bit of, um, you know, a can-do attitude and, and having the skill set and the motivation and, 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 and getting, you know, the politicians and the public, you know, the public are the ones who, who elect the politicians, you know, if we can get enough people uh, to understand the capability, you know, and all of the industry sectors, you know, across agriculture and whatever, you know, there's a whole range of different um, data sets and uh, information that supports decision making. So, you know, as people understand the capability and the production benefits where we're going to get from it, um, it's just a really exciting uh, time and, and, and opportunity with, uh, with a huge amount of upside. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll leave you to it and enjoy the rest of your day or night or morning, wherever you're coming from around the world. Thanks again, Nick, for taking the time and uh, stay safe and healthy, guys. Super. Thank you. Best of luck to you all. See you later.